For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. We're so glad that you've decided to join us again. This is part two of the presentation, Sinner or Saint. In the first part of this presentation, we looked at what it means to be a sinner. Now, it's a term that none of us like and we don't want to be called a sinner. But the fact remains that all have sinned according to the Bible and fallen short of the glory of God. As Christians, we give our lives to Jesus. And while we give our lives to Jesus, not everything has changed. Our motives have, our intentions have, yes, and our direction in life has changed. But then there's the draw and the pull to the old man, the old way of life. We don't have to succumb to those things. That's why the Bible also calls us saints. When we give our lives to Jesus, we are separated unto Jesus and we become what He calls us holy ones. Now that term sometimes feels like it's no better than sinner because we don't feel deserving of that term to be called holy ones or to be saints. How do we live as sinners and saints all at the same time? First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, Paul wrote, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul wrote as a saint that he was a sinner. What does that mean? It's interesting that Paul wrote this after his conversion. And we know Paul was a saint. There's no doubt about that. And yet he said he was the chief of sinners. So how does this work and what did he mean? And could that have anything to do with the fact that as followers of Jesus, as saints, we will always feel a complete dependency upon Jesus and his sustaining grace? Well, you're going to have to find out. Make sure you've got your Bibles open. Make sure you're in a prayerful attitude. And let's go live now to watch the second part of this very important presentation, Sinner or Saint. To be a saint means to be separated to God. That's what it means. It not only refers to God's action apart from us, we come to Him by faith in repentance. We say, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And God declares us, He forgives us and declares us to be His saint. He sets us apart. The work of justification brings with it the work of sanctification. God separates us to Himself and for holy purposes. So it not only refers to God's action apart from ours, but it also includes the responsibility that is ours to live lives that are also holy by God's grace. However, we cannot live separate lives without being separated first. Because God has separated us to Himself, we are to live in conformity to who He is. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, uh, Peter, quoting Leviticus, writes and commands us, Be holy. And God says, Be holy, for I am holy. That's a command. Of course, God has given us the Holy Spirit to make holy living possible. In many cases in the Bible, the word saint is used to refer not to those who are a completed work, but to those who are a work in progress. Look with me at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12, if you would. A familiar passage to each of us. And, um, and notice uh, what God declares His last day people to be. By the way, when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and he, de and he declares them to be saints, sanctified, set apart, called to be saints, when you read the, the book when you read Paul's letter to the, Cor the church in Corinth, he wrote two letters. Did, the Cor Corinth, did some of the members in Corinth have a problem? Some of the members in Corinth had a problem. And that's what the letter was written to address. And yet he still called them saints. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not, not suggesting here that, uh, that sin is condoned or, or uh, a, a, a wrong or bad theology is condoned just because you're called a saint. The point being here is God first separates us to Himself and then, and then works in us, as I've mentioned before, and I've, as I've quoted before, to both will and to do of His good pleasure, to make us holy. He first separates us from the world, first separates us from, from sin, and then, he, and then He works in us. 
to overcome sin by His grace through the Holy Spirit, you see. Notice, notice Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. It says here, talking about God's last day people, it says, here are, or here is, the patience of who? The saints. So just prior to this, you've got a three-point message under the umbrella of the everlasting gospel that's got to go to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. And uh, there are people who respond to this message. There are people who accept this message in these last days. And God calls them His saints. Here are those who do what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Does that sound like it's something that they've already arrived at or is something that is progressive and continuing to happen in their lives each and every day? It's something that's occurring each and every day, is it not? Surely there's no doubt about that. If you're in need of the faith of Christ, then have you arrived or are you still on your way? You're still on your way, you see. So if you've accepted Jesus as Savior and you've accepted Him as Lord, then you are a saint. Then you are a saint. Okay. So let's dig a little deeper here and see if we can answer the question, sinless sinners or sinning saints? We're going to go to 1 John and we're going to go to chapter 1, and uh, here we have in this book, it helps us understand, there there are uh, two passages of Scripture that help us understand the two arms of truth. It's very likely that we are both sinner and saint at the same time, and these two arms cannot be separated from Jesus, who is the truth. These, These verses help us, or these passages, help us understand the reality that Christians live with on a day to day basis. This letter has often caused uh, commentators some trouble because the two se- sections of the book that we're going to read here often appear to contradict each other. But let's take a look. First John chapter 1, and we're going to read, start starting with verse 6, and we're going to read right through to chapter 2 and verse 2. So let's read. Notice, John says, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So John makes several points in these verses. And just follow along with me here. Number one, he says, claiming to have fellowship with God while living a sinful life, living in the darkness, is a lie. Number two, properly living or living in the light, proper living, properly living, brings fellowship with one another and cleansing through Christ's sacrificial death. We read that in verse 7. And then we, point number three that he makes, if one makes the claim that they no longer, they are no longer sinning, then they are lying and are out of touch with the truth. Fourth, confession of sin leads to forgiveness and cleansing of sin. And then five, Christians should not sin, but if they do, Jesus intercedes for them and, uh, and is the means of restoring uh, their relationship with God. So these are the points that Paul makes, five points that he makes right here in these particular verses. Clearly, John was objecting to the claims of some that uh, suggested they were out without sin and without guilt. He rejects this perfectionism. Let me explain that word to you, this perfectionism. That's different from character, biblical character perfection. Perfectionism, the teaching that suggests one has reached a point in their lives where they can never sin. Where they can never sin. Versus will not sin. There's a difference. That's what perfectionism is. And so he was, he was opposed to and rejected this, this, this idea as a possibility and presents instead a theology of ongoing confession, forgiveness, cleansing through Christ. But then we come to 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. Notice what he says. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, 
and sin is lawlessness. And you know that He, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. Whoever abides in Him does not what? Sin. Whoever sins has neither seen Him nor known Him. Little children, let, one, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as He, Jesus, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that He might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has, be, has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God are the, and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. All right. Now, this passage on the surface appears to some to contradict the previous section we read. Earlier, John is, had said that if we say we, we do not sin, then we are liars. Here we find that the one remaining in Christ is not sinning and is not able to sin because God's seed remains in him or her. Furthermore, the, sinning does not, uh, the, the one sinning does not know Christ, but he is from the devil. So have both passages of Scripture actually come from the same pen, the same hand? The previous John, uh, pre the problem rather John was addressing, contained two errors that we mentioned. Some people claimed to be living in such close fellowship with God that they no longer sinned and that they were beyond sinning. A heretical perfectionism, not, again, not biblical perfection, was the result. Second, despite claims of fellowship with God, these people were living as if God made no difference in their lives. So the teaching in 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through chapter 2, verses 2, was designed to help readers understand the problem and reality of sin and the need for forgiveness and cleansing in Christ. But that alone, however, would not solve the problem, for some would still be living lives antithetical to Jesus Christ. Much of the rest of the letter describes the life required by the Christian. The purpose of the letter can be summed up in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. Notice, 1 John, 2, 1 John 2 verse 6, He who says he abides in him, that is Jesus, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. That's exactly right. So a Christian cannot go on sinning as if being in Christ made no difference. If there has been no change so that love, that love dominates the life, there has been no rebirth. It is this aspect of the teaching that is in view in 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. While a sinless perfectionism is to be rejected, our new birth excludes a sinful way of life. Maybe a helpful way to understand 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10 is to focus on the tenses in the Greek verbs. When the writer uh, speaks of sinning, he puts it in the present tense. Uh, this would stress the action, uh, stress that the action is continual. So when you look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 6, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 6, let's read what it says here. It says, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. So whoever abides in him does not sin. Is in fact, whoever abides in him does not continue to sin. And in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not continue to sin. That's what John is writing here. The focus is on a life characterized by sin. Those in Christ cannot live a sinful lifestyle for rebirth has placed God's seed, the seed of His Word, the seed of the Holy Spirit in them. Those who live a life characterized by sin do not know God and do not know the Father, you see. So, the truth of 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 through 2 and 2, through 2, 2, and 1 John 3, verses 4 through 10, is evident. We cannot, we cannot escape the reality of sin. We cannot. The denial of sin and its guilt is borders on delusional and evidence of distance from God. Sin is to be confessed and forgiven, and cleansing are to be found in Christ. Yet on the other hand, 
Sin is not to be taken for, for granted, nor is it to be practiced. Those in Christ cannot live a life characterized by sin. We, we need to know this today. The work of God accomplishes our conversion. The work of God that accomplishes our conversion is to be continually at work in us, changing our, our lives, motivating us to share God's message of love and His end-time salvation with others. We are sinners, but we are saints as we abide and stay connected to Jesus Christ. We need Christ. This is the message today. We need Christ as we need the air we breathe. We need His forgiveness and we need His power as much as the food that we eat. That's what this message is all about here this morning. The truth we find in Jesus is that we are Christ's dependence. We are Jesus' dependence. We need Him to sustain our spiritual lives every hour. We are not safe for one moment if we let go the hand of God. We are in danger of succumbing to the temptation or the temper, the old temper of the old man if we don't lean on Jesus for strength. We are no more capable of bearing the fruit of righteousness disconnected from Christ than the severed branch of a fruit tree can produce apples or oranges or peaches, that fruit from that particular tree. Now you remember those words in Galatians chapter 5 verse 17. Let's go there and take a look at those. Let's take a look at those words again. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. We're going to put all this together here, and we are doing that right now. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. That's what Paul says. Paul essentially is reminding us about the ongoing war. The struggle between the inclination to do right and the inclination to do that which is wrong. Not that one can't overcome the flesh, but that they are powerless to do so in their own strength. And when he's talking about flesh, he's talking about our fallen natures, you see. In the book Great Controversy, page 506, Ellen White says, It is the grace that Christ implants in the soul which creates in man enmity or hatred against Satan. Without this converting grace and renewing power, man would continue to be captive to Satan, a servant ever ready to do his bidding. But, I like that word, but, but the new principle in the soul creates conflict where to had been peace. Conflict where? Conflict between us and God? No, no, no. Conflict now between you and who? The devil, before you just went, you and I just went along with his suggestions. But now that new uh, principle put in our hearts at conversion creates uh, opposition to what the devil wants us to do, conflict. The power which Christ imparts enables man to resist the tyrant and the usurper. Whoever is seen to abhor sin instead of loving it, whoever resists and conquers those passions that have held sway within, displays the operation of a principle wholly from God. Powerful words. Powerful words. Some people suggest we have two natures in us. It would be better to suggest that there are two principles in opposition to each other in us. We're born with one, an inclination to do that which is wrong, to displease God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And yet we come to Jesus and he implants in us a new principle. We are born again. And that fights and wrestles and struggles against the carnal nature. And through Jesus, we can be victorious now and forever. You've got to think about saints of old for just with me for just a moment. Saints of old Moses. The Bible says he was the meekest man that ever lived. His righteous life, friend, was dependent on his constant connection to Jesus. However, in a moment of frustration... And exasperation, he unleashed on God's people and ended up being barred from the promised land. His past victories could not atone for this one mistake and what a costly mistake it was. The end of his story teaches you and I today that, our, that of, of our constant need of connection to Jesus Christ. Think about David out there in the hills tending to his sheep, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. How would you like to be called a man after God's own heart? 
He began so well, and yet when he took his eyes off Jesus, he stooped to take another man's wife and then do away with her husband. Now, he ended up repenting and submitting his life to God's will, but the story teaches us that our past connection to Christ has no bearing on our connection with Jesus now. We've got to stay connected to Jesus' sustaining grace. Think about Solomon. Solomon began his rulership well when he answered God's query, what do you want? With the words, I don't know how to come in or to go out, and I need your wisdom to properly lead your people. And yet he drifted from God's will. He turned on himself and sought to satisfy all of his cravings and his desires. The lesson he learned was absolutely bitter. He turned his life back over to God. But it wasn't before he had set the stage for the undoing of the, the nation that he was leading. His story teaches us of our perpetual need of Christ and his saving grace. That's what Paul was saying when he declared, this is a faithful saying in 1 Timothy 1.15. We looked at it earlier. This is what Paul was saying when he declared, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul had a sense of his own unworthiness even after conversion. He does not say, I was chief. He says, I am chief. His humility arises from the memory of his past insults and persecutions done to God and to his church, as well as his awareness of his present insufficiency, apart from the daily sustaining power that God could give him. All God's saints never lose the sense of unworthiness that they experienced when they first surrendered the will to Christ. They know that without the daily indwelling power of God, their life would not reveal the graces of Christian character. In Christ Object Lessons, page 160, and I've, I've just about finished, it says, the nearer we come to Jesus and the more clearly we discern the purity of His character, the more clearly we shall discern the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the less we shall feel like exalting ourselves. Our only safeguard, friends, is to remember who we were before we came to Jesus, to place no confidence in self and to gladly submit to the will and desires of God each and every day. Now, although we are both sinner, because Paul says, I am chief, right? Although we are both sinner and saint, that does not mean that we live anxiety-ridden lives. The Bible offers three strategies to live the life of Christ's end time saints. Here they are. We're going to put them up on the screen for you. Number one, focus on Jesus. That's the only way we can be victorious. Focus on Jesus. Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are we know, while we know we are born in sin and live in the sphere of sin and have sinful natures and have sinned, sin is not to be our focus. Christ is to be our focus. As we behold Christ, we continually grow to be more like Him, whom it is said knew no sin. For example, if we take seriously His exception, acceptance of maybe society's outcasts, we too will find the courage and show the grace and sensitivity to people, society, would just as soon forget. As we look to Jesus, the Holy Spirit empowers us for service. His Spirit is given to us as a guarantee of eternal life and the means of effective Christian witness. So number one, focus on Jesus. Number two, be honest. John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. We need to be ruthlessly honest with God, ourselves, and with each other. Someone wrote, honesty requires that we be suspicious about ourselves, our motives, and our desires, to face squarely that we are inverted around ourselves. We're all too ready to go it alone and forget that God exists. We're prone to do this with our time and even with our treasures. How often do we need to consult God about how we spend in our time and our money? Do we put God first? Truth is more the most important ingredient for successful Christian living. Confession merely admits the truth and worship is telling the truth about God and what He has done for us in Christ Jesus. By acknowledging that we are both sinner and saint, we face the reality of our lives. Honesty requires that we admit that we are always tempted by pride and pleasure. We are capable of any sin. Honesty causes us to remember that we are temporary, that we have brought nothing into this world and that we will take nothing out. 
Honesty also requires that we view ourselves as God views us. If God says that we are a new life, we have a new life in Christ Jesus, should we believe any less? The determining factor in our lives is not what we have done, but what our standing is with God. We live always by His grace, and that is the truth. And thirdly, thirdly, the third strategy to live the life of Christ's end-time saints is we need to rebel against sin. We need to rebel against sin. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14 suggests that we should push back on sin, rebel against sin, move from under the lordship of sin. We shouldn't think of ourselves as wandering aimlessly between sin and the right living. We ought not give in to sin as if it was inevitable or even acceptable. It is not acceptable and we do not to give in to it. For example, it would be easy to say nobody is perfect, everybody lies a little to protect themselves, What's the matter if, what's the problem if I do it? But each time that happens, we destroy ourselves a little. Sin is not to be tolerated, and Calvary teaches us that. When Paul discusses Christian living in Romans 6, verses 12 through 14, he calls us for an all out rebellion against the tyranny of sin. Sin no longer has the right to rule over you, and you and I should not let it. Being a saint, is a change of lordships. Sin is no longer Lord. Who's Lord now? Christ. Christ is Lord. After it was disclosed, and now I'm closing, after it was disclosed that President George H. W. Bush had banned broccoli aboard the Air Force One when he was president, the nation apparently became embroiled in a broccoli discussion. As broccoli growers dispatched 10 tons of the vegetable free to Washington, the president reiterated his disdain and distaste with gusto. He said, I do not like broccoli. I have liked it since I was a little kid, and my mother made me eat of it. I am president of the United States, and I'm not going to eat any more broccoli. (laughs) Like the former president of the United States, who rebelled against broccoli, let you and I rebel against sin. What do you say? Rebel an all-out war against sin by God's grace. For now, we cannot escape. It's true, our sinful bodies. We cannot escape our evil inclinations. We cannot escape the sinful temptations. But in Christ, we are saints. God's people who He has called and has given His Spirit to. Don't you desire to be God's end time saints. I do too. May God help us. May God bless us. May God empower us with his spirit so that we might truly call an all out war against sin is my prayer. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to sacentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.